Welcome back to Complex Analysis, everyone. So we're beginning a subject today that's going to take us pretty much to the end of the semester, and that's integration. Now, integration is really, first of all, it's really awesome, and we're going to get some really, really beautiful results. But it's it's kind of different than it is back in calculus. We still want to be guided by our calculus you know, intuition, but the way we do integrals in, in complex analysis, you're going to see, is, is a little bit strange. Yeah, we have antiderivatives and, and things like that, but... Really, we kind of use these other theorems and results to sort of evaluate integrals for us, which we'll, we'll, we'll see in a little bit. But in any case, let's go ahead and get started. All right, so integration in complex land, first of all, has more implications than its real counterpart. What I mean by that is, well, if you think about calculus, what happens, right? We learn about the integral, we learn about integration techniques, and we kind of move on, right? We get into um, infinite series and sequences, power series, Taylor's theorem. Um, Taylor polynomials, all that good stuff, right? Well, in complex land, yeah, we're going to talk about integration, and we don't really have integration techniques per se, but we actually have a lot of really, really cool results and, and theorems that we're going to be diving into. Um, so it's, it's sort of more rich in a way. Uh, now, as we're going through, what I recommend, rely on your Calc 1 and 3 intuition. So Calc 1, we're going to be talking about integration. So, of course, all your integral rules sort of come into play a little bit. Um, and now, because of the nature of the complex numbers, remember it's two-dimensional, we're going to have to sort of utilize Calc 3 as well. So it's kind of a, a cool mixture of the two in a way. But again, it's going to extend sort of beyond what we used to do in calculus. Um, but in any case, rely on your Calc 1 and 3 intuition. But again, be prepared for some new and really, really cool and beautiful things. Um, so. Our first sort of major switch between calculus integration and complex analysis integration is the following idea. Okay, so in Calc 1, we usually integrate over intervals, right? Or sometimes we integrate over multiple intervals, but that's not really as common. But we usually integrate over some kind of interval A to B, right? And if you think about the real numbers, okay, so let's say this is A and this is B, there's really not much going on here. You To get to A, or to get to B from A, I should say, there's really only one way to do it. We can go this way, right? And that's about it. When you integrate over an interval, well, you start here, and then you have one way you can go, and you end here, and that's it. Well, in complex land, okay, let's say we have two complex numbers, so I'm going to call it A tilde, and let's say B tilde, okay? Um, so if we're thinking about two complex numbers and we want to integrate from one complex number to another, well, we actually have infinitely many ways we can go. We can go this way. We can go this way. We can maybe circle A a couple of times and then get to B. We're never going to do that, by the way. But in any case, there's infinitely many ways that we can get from A to B. Okay. And so usually what we're thinking about instead of intervals and complex analysis, because we don't really have intervals in complex land, we're going to be thinking about paths. Okay, so what are the ways you can get from this complex number to the other complex number? And again, just like in Calc 3 with limits, um, there's infinitely many paths. We can get from this complex number here to this complex number infinitely many ways. Okay, so that's going to give us sort of a, a more rich integration setting. So in any case, because we're going to be integrating over paths, the first thing we need to figure out is, well, how do you define the integral over a path? Okay. So that's where we're going to start. So in order to define the integral over a path, let's go ahead and consider a path. Okay, so a path is just a function from an interval. Okay, so there's your calculus one coming in. And in interval a, b, where these are real numbers here, to c. Okay, and we require that this is a continuous um, function as well. Okay, so again, the idea of a path, it's kind of like if you remember back in Calc 3, parametric equations or parameterizations or curves defined parametrically, it's all the same thing. But basically what's happening is we have some kind of curve. So let's say this is the complex plane. We have some kind of curve going from here to here. And I don't know, maybe it does something like this. It has to be continuous, so whatever that means. Um, so it kind of looks like this. But the idea is you can think about your inputs here as time, time parameters. Okay, so when you plug in A, you're starting at this point. Okay, and then when you plug in B, you end at this point. And then anything in between A and B, let's say C, you're at this point here. Okay, so when we talk about paths, we mean pretty much the same thing we meant back in Calc 3, parameterized curves in R2. 
Okay. The, and again, parameterized by usually we we denote it with t. We think about it as time. And all of our inputs are sort of giving us a time value, and then they're outputting where you're at on the path. So time t equal to a is the start, time t equal to b is the end, and then any point in between, you're some point on the path. Okay. Now, naturally, what this is doing also, which I don't think your book gets into quite yet, but when we talk about paths, we naturally have some sort of like orientation, meaning which direction are we going. So when we say that we're going from A, B to C, well, at time t equal to A, that's our starting point. Time t equal to B is our ending point. So our path is going this way. It's flowing like this. Okay, And that's going to become important not quite soon, but we will get to the where that's important anyway. But I just want you just to notice paths come with a direction. which later we're going to call orientation, come with a direction. OK, in any case, this is what we're going to be dealing with. Instead of intervals, we're dealing with these things called paths. And paths are the same things they were back in Calc 3. They're literally a curve in R2 that's somehow given by time. Okay. So if we have a curve like this, okay, then we define the integral over this path as follows. Okay. Let me get back to green. So the integral from a to b, so this is your start and your end time okay, of g of t, our path, is defined to be, so you integrate the real part, because remember, this function is going into c, right, which means that it has a real and an imaginary part. So to integrate your um, path, or over your path, I should say, um, or I'm sorry, to integrate this path, we sort of integrate the real part and the imaginary part separately and add them together. So the integral is defined to be, well, you integrate the real part plus i times the imaginary part. And then whatever you get, that's your integral. Okay. Now these right here, I, I will say, these are calc 1 integrals. Calc 1 integrals. Okay. So for instance, if your function, let's say g of t is equal to, I don't know, i plus t, and t is going from, I don't know, 0 to 2, Okay. then the integral from 0 to 2 of g of t would be equal to the integral from 0 to 2 t dt. Okay. And again, that's a calc 1 integral there. Plus i times what's the imaginary part. The imaginary part is secretly 1 here. Plus i times the integral from 0 to 2, 1 dt. Okay. So again, another calc 1 integral here. Okay. So this is sort of a, a way of taking a calc 3 concept and really bringing it or boiling it back down to calc 1 in a way. Okay. Now this definition shouldn't be, become as, uh, a huge surprise because if you think about calc 3 and integrating let's say a function g of t equal to some vector, so you would think about your vector valued functions t 2 plus t, how would we integrate a function like this? Well we would integrate each coordinate, right? So it's kind of the same idea there. OK, so now we just talked about, well, how do you integrate a path in C? Well, how do you actually integrate a complex function? Because if you remember back in calculus, we integrate functions, right? f of x dx, question mark, right? Well, how do you integrate a function f of z equal to, I don't know, e to the z over some path? OK, well, this is how we do it. So suppose gamma, OK, and gamma is going to be our notation for paths is a smooth path, meaning it's continuous, it has derivatives, or it's differentiable, I should say. So suppose gamma is a smooth path parameterized by, so basically this is giving us that parameterization or that function structure with time. Okay. So gamma is a smooth path parameterized by this function, phi, um, gamma of t, from a to b. And let's suppose that f is a complex function which is continuous on this path. Okay. So maybe... This is our path right here. I don't know. Something like this. So this right here would be gamma of A. This would be gamma of B. Okay. So we have some kind of smooth path. And then we have a complex function that's continuous on this path, meaning if you plug in any point, okay, or if you take any point on this path, our function here is going to be continuous at that point. Okay. So we define the integral of f on gamma as follows. Okay, so notational speaking looks very, very similar to what it would look like either in Calc 1 or Calc 3. So the integral over gamma of f, 
is equal to the integral over gamma of f of z dz. So if we want to throw in our variable, that's what it's going to look like. And so we define this integral to be the following. So it's equal to the integral from a to b, which is your start and ending points, or ending your time values for your path, f of gamma of t times gamma prime of t dt. Okay. Now this might look a little strange, but basically what's going on here, this is just a, a u substitution. What you're doing is you're letting z be gamma of t. And then if we find or change our, our differential here, okay, dz, take the derivative of both sides, we're going to get dz is equal to gamma prime of t dt. And so if we substitute these into our formula here, we get exactly this over here. So basically, this is sort of like a chain rule. Okay, So the integral of a function over a path is defined to be the integral from a to b f of the path times the derivative of that path, where we're integrating with respect to t. All right, so let's go ahead and see an example. So let's consider the function f of z equal to z plus z conjugate. And we're going to look at two paths from 0 to 2i. Okay, so let me go ahead and draw this really quick. So here's our complex plane. And here's 0 here. And here's 2i right here. Okay, so we're going to look at two paths from 0 to 2i here. The first path is going to be, um, I would say, the more, more fruitful example in a way. And that's i plus e to the it. Okay, so just to remind you, what is this? Well, first of all, this is a circle centered at i okay, with radius 1. Okay, and we know it's radius 1 because the number in front of our exponential there is 1, secretly, even though we don't write it there. So it has radius 1. And we're taking this, the part of the circle going from t equal to negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. So basically, that's giving us our rotation there. Okay, So where is negative pi over 2? Well, negative pi over 2, if this is i here, that would start right here at the origin. And then it's going to go all the way up to pi over 2, which in our case will be 2i. Okay. So this is the path that we're considering here. And I'm actually going to put an arrow just to show you which way we're traveling. We're going from minus pi over 2 all the way up to 2i. Okay. So we're going to see this a lot, by the way. Let me just go ahead and erase this and generalize this a little bit. Okay, So if you ever see something like this, gamma of t equal to, we'll just say a plus b e to the i t, this is always going to be, assuming that this is a, a real, b is a real number, positive real number, I should say. This is always going to be a circle centered at a with radius b. Okay. Now, a is allowed to be a complex number, but again, b, because we're thinking about it as a radius, that always has to be a positive real number. Okay. So I'm just going to put a little note here. Okay. Um, all right. So considering this first path, let's go ahead and integrate this. What would be the integral of our function over this path here? Okay. So the integral of f over gamma 1 here okay, is defined to be, so it's the integral from, we're going from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, okay, f of gamma 1 times gamma 1 prime dt. And I'm being a little loose with my notation there, but let's go ahead and start plugging this stuff in and seeing what we get. So first of all, what is gamma 1 prime? So let's take the derivative of this thing. Gamma 1 prime is equal to, so take the derivative with respect to t, you see that we'll get i e to the i t. Okay, notice the derivative of i, i is a constant that goes away. And what's the derivative of the exponential function? Well, it's just itself. And then by chain rule, we also have that i factor going on. So what, is, what happens with our integral? Our integral will become integral from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, f of i plus e to the i t, i e to the i t, dt. Okay. So now all we have to do is figure out, well, what the heck does the function do to this? Remember, our function is z plus z conjugate, right? So let's simplify our integrand a little bit. Use some brackets here because we're going to need some room. So it's z. So if you just 
just the identity function first. Okay, e or i plus e to the i t. And then plus, now we're going to take the conjugate of this. And remember, the conjugate is just going to be negative i plus e to the negative i t. Okay. Remember, you take your imaginary part and you change the sign. Okay. And then don't forget, we're multiplying this whole thing by i e to the i t dt. And now again, we have a nice little calc 1 integral. So I'm going to need a little bit of room. Let me go ahead and erase that. OK, so let's go ahead and distribute our, well, actually, before we do that, notice the i's cancel out. Okay, one of the nice things about this function here. And then let's go ahead and distribute our i e to the i t in. So we'll get negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. OK, and then let's see, we will have i e to the 2 i t. And then we'll get plus i dt. OK. So now we should be in good shape to integrate this. Let's integrate this. Now, remember, we're integrating with respect to t. So this is going to be equal to, so let's see, i over 2i e to the 2it. So that's coming from chain rule plus it. That's just from power rule evaluated at pi over 2, or negative pi over 2, I should say, to pi over 2. Okay. So let's plug, actually, before we plug in, notice the i's cancel out. Okay, and now let's plug in the top bound and the bottom bound. So if we plug in pi over 2, we're going to get 1 half e to the i pi. Plus, if we plug in pi over 2 into this, we're going to get i pi over 2. Okay, so we plugged in our upper bound. Minus, if we plug in our lower bound, we're going to get 1 half e to the now minus i pi minus i pi over 2. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and simplify this a little bit. So first of all, remember e to the i t is equal to cosine of t plus i sine of t. Okay, so if we have i pi, okay, so e to the i pi, this is just going to be get out of here, PowerPoint, cosine of pi plus i sine of pi, which remembering your trig, that's just going to give us in the end negative 1. So we'll have negative 1 plus i pi over 2 minus, and similarly, whoops, I also forgot the 1 half there, so let me put it over 2 there. Um, similarly, 1 half e to the minus i pi is also going to be negative 1 half. Okay, and then minus i pi over 2. Now notice these 1 halves will cancel out. And all we're going to be left with is if we distribute the negative sign, i pi over 2 plus i pi over 2, which is just equal to i pi. Boom. Okay. So again, not really much different from what we would do back in Calc 1. Okay. I mean, we now we have complex numbers, obviously, but essentially all this is is it's a u substitution, and then we're just integrating with respect to t, and we just hope that whatever function we're integrating with respect to is integrable. Okay, it's it's nice in a way. Okay, so let's look at another example, um, or another path, I should say. So remember, we're going from zero to two i. So zero is our origin. Okay, and we just traveled along sort of the circumference of a circle of radius 1 from 0 to 2i, OK? Now, our next path is a lot simpler than that. It's just i t from 0 to where t is going from 0 to 2. So basically, we're just going up the real axis there, OK? So this path is just going to be 0 all the way up to 2i, like this. So we're just going literally just going straight up here. Okay. A much simpler path. Nothing too crazy going on with that. So what does our integral look like in this case? Okay, so our integral with respect to now gamma 2, this, this other path, is equal to, okay, so first of all, again, like we did last time, let's go and take the derivative. So the derivative of gamma 2 is just going to be i. Okay, so then our integral is going to become 
the integral from 0 to 2, our starting and our ending point for our path, f of i t times i dt. All right, so let's plug in i t into our function here. Okay, so if you plug in i t, what are you going to get? Well, the first part here, if you plug i t into z, you're just going to get i t itself back. Nothing too crazy going on there. Plus, the conjugate of i t is just going to be minus i t. Remember, you're going to take your, you're going to change the sign of your imaginary part. Okay, and notice what happens. These cancel out, giving us zero. And what's the integral of zero, everyone? Hopefully, you all remember that. That's just zero. Okay, so the integral from uh, over the path gamma 2, where we're just going straight up the imaginary axis, is just equal to 0. Okay. All right, so uh, a couple of comments. Um, actually, let's go back really quick. First of all, I just want to show you the two answers we got. We got i pi, and that was traveling a, a, along the circle of radius 1 in this case. And then when we just went straight up the imaginary axis, we got 0. All right, so a couple of comments. So we've just integrated f twice over two different paths. So first thing I want you to notice is that the path did matter, right? When we integrated over this path, gamma 1, we got i pi over here, OK? And when we integrated just going straight up, we got 0, OK? So note, different paths may give us different answers. Different paths may give different answers, which maybe intuitively makes sense, right? Because we're, we're integrating over a different set of complex numbers, right? So again, just to give you that picture, remember that first curve was going like this. Okay, This was gamma 1. And then our second curve, gamma 2. So with gamma 1, we got i pi. And then gamma 2, we got 0. All right, so the next thing we're going to talk about is parameterization. And in fact, parameterization does not matter. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's look at our curve again that we were just analyzing. And now for some reason, my pen wants to go back to red. Um, so remember, the first curve we looked at from 0 to 2i was this curve right here, going from 0 to 2i along the circle, right? And it was going this way. Okay, but remember back in Calc 3, we can take the same curve and give it infinitely many parameterizations, right? There's not one parameterization for every curve. There's infinitely many of them. So for example, let's look at gamma 3 here. Gamma 3 is also another parameterization of this same curve here, okay? And it'll give us the same curve as long as we're careful with our, our time values. But in any case, gamma 3 equal to i, so we're still centered at i, centered. Uh, there we go. Uh, it's centered at i, and it still has radius 1. Okay, But notice the only difference between gamma 1 and gamma 3 is we have a 2 here. Okay, Now, if you remember back from calc 3, what is that 2 going to do? Well, that 2 kind of speeds things up a little bit. In fact, if you think about speed, this curve or this parameterization sort of goes twice as fast as the first parameterization. So that 2 is really just speeding things up. Okay, so if you're a particle that's traveling on gamma 3, you're going to go twice as fast than if you were traveling on gamma 1. Okay, so that's what that 2 is doing there. Um, so in any case, if we consider this curve okay, and give it these two parameterizations here, we'll actually get the same integral in the end. If I integrate gamma uh, f over gamma 3, I should get the same thing as we got earlier. Okay. Although we have to be a little bit careful with our time values here, which we'll talk about in a second. But in any case, the point I'm trying to make here is that the parameterization does not matter from the integral. Again, given any curve, you can always give it infinitely many parameterizations. But as long as you're careful with your time values and everything matches up, it actually doesn't matter. Okay. So let's actually see that. Let's see that in action just so you don't... I mean, hopefully you trust me, but let's just make sure that that is legit. 
So first of all, what are my time values that are going to give me the same curve? Since we're going twice as fast here, we only need to go from negative pi over 4, so half the time, to pi over 4. Okay. So let's integrate f. And remember, f was z plus z bar. Okay. So let's integrate that, and let's see what we get. Okay. So first things first. A few moments later. And hopefully you notice here, I'm just going to plug everything in, but you're going to see we're essentially getting the same calculation we got earlier. Okay, so this is going to be, let's see, if I plug in pi over 4, we're going to get 1 half e to the, let's see, i pi, okay, plus i times pi over 2. Okay, so that's what we get if we plug in our upper bound. Minus, if we plug in our lower bound, we're going to get 1 half e to the minus i pi, okay, and then minus i pi over 2. So it's exactly the same calculation we had before, so notice we are going to get the same thing in the end. So the point is, given a curve, okay, we can have infinitely many parameterizations for it, but in terms of integration, it doesn't matter what parameterization you give. As long as you're good with your time values and everything matches up, the integral or the, the number you're going to get in the end after integrating should be the same thing. All right, so let's go ahead and make that official now. Um, so given gamma and sigma, and again, we're sort of imagining these as parameterizing the same curve, we say that sigma is a reparameterization of gamma if there's an increasing piecewise smooth map of CD onto AB that takes gamma to sigma in the sense that sigma is equal to gamma of tau. So basically, this is saying that there's some way of converting one parameterization into the other. So if we think about our two earlier examples, we had i plus e to the um, i t, and we had gamma 3 was i plus e to the uh, 2 i t. We can definitely convert one into the other just by making the transformation Let's let t be 2s, okay? And if we substitute that into here, notice gamma 1 is going to become gamma 3. So that's what this def definition is saying. We can take one parameterization and make it into the other one through some other map that we're, we're forcing to be increasing um, and piecewise smooth. So in any case, let's go ahead and formalize what we just we're talking about. So proposition, let's suppose that gamma of t is a piecewise smooth parameterization of a curve, and let's suppose that sigma of t is another parameterization of that same curve, okay? Or more formally, pinkies up everyone, it's a reparameterization of gamma. Then the proposition says that, well, you do get the same integral in the end. It doesn't matter which parameterization you chose. All right, so the last thing I want to talk about is a couple of... Um, results or properties our integrals have that are very similar to what we had back in calculus. And then I want to rem or recommend a problem for you all to do that's, that's we're going to see a lot in the coming videos and lectures and classes. Um, so first, proposition 4.6, properties of um, integrals. So our first property is something that hopefully we all know and love and makes our life a whole lot easier. Basically, what this is saying is that we can always distribute an integral over a sum, and we can always pull out constants. Okay, so this is our distribution. And I'm going to put that in quotes. It's not distribution. It's not like the integral is a number or anything, but it's kind of like distributing the integral and constant rule. Okay. Part B, and this is, again, something very similar to what we saw in Calc 1. So remember in Calc 1, if we were integrating f of x from a to b, and we decided to flip the bounds, so let's go from b to a instead, what happens to the integral? Okay. Well, hopefully you all remember what happens to the integral is, well, you have to multiply by minus 1, right? So you can, you can flip the bounds as long as you multiply by a minus 1. So it's sort of at the cost of a minus sign. Okay. Well, the idea in complex land, let's say we have a path from A to B. Okay. And normally we go this way. Okay. What happens if you decided to go the other direction? Instead of going from A to B, what if you go from B to A? So let's say instead of going this way, I'm going to use a different color, we go this way. Okay. Well, this property is saying you get essentially the same number, but just like it happened back in calculus, you have to multiply by a minus sign. 
So that's what property B is saying, but it's more precise because they're defining the the opposite path or the other direction path. But in any case, essentially what this part is saying is that if you flip directions, okay, so if you start from the end and go to the beginning, you'll get the same number, but the sign's gonna be different. Okay, you're gonna have a, it's gonna be at the cost of a minus sign again. Part C. So suppose gamma 1 and gamma 2 are piecewise smooth paths so that gamma 2 starts where gamma 1 ends. So let's kind of draw a picture here. So let's say this is gamma 1. And let's say gamma 2 is something like this. Okay. So what this part proposition is saying is that if I want to integrate over the whole path, okay, what we can do is integrate along each of the smaller paths, because maybe that's easier, I don't know. But we can integrate along each of the smaller paths and just add them together to give us the full integral. Okay, Something very, very similar to back in calculus, right? Because in calculus, we had a similar property that, let's say we have an interval from A to B. And let's say we had a number C in the middle that breaks up our interval, then the integral from A to B is equal to the integral from A to C, the first part, plus the integral from C to B, the second part. Okay, so same property that we had back in Calc 1. Now the last property you may have seen, or you may not have seen, but it's a little bit more complicated, but it's, it's the following. So it's saying that the integral, or the modulus of the integral, can only be as big as the modulus of the biggest output your function can have on the path times the length of the path, okay? Now, let me draw you a picture just to kind of show you what's going on here. And I'm gonna draw you like a, re a calculus setting here, okay? So let's think about the function x squared on zero to one. Okay, so if we draw this picture, Okay, so the integral from 0 to 1, remember that's the area underneath the curve, right? So that would represent this right here. Okay, so what this property is essentially saying is, well, instead of calculating this integral, we can give an upper bound for this integral by doing the following. Okay, so if we think about the function x squared on 0 to 1, where is it the biggest? Well, notice it's the biggest. Let me use a different color here. It's the biggest here at 1. Okay. So if we just take 1 and multiply it by the length of our interval, okay, 0 to 1, we're going to get this big green blocks here, okay, which we're actually going to get 1 if you calculate the area of this rectangle or this box. And notice that this area is going to be bigger than the red area there. So that's what this property is essentially saying. The integral, or the modulus of the integral, because we're dealing with complex numbers here, is less than or equal to the modulus of the biggest output times the length of your, your path or your curve. Okay. Now we will be seeing that in two or three videos, um, and we will actually see property C as well. But in any case, these are properties that we sort of had back in calculus, but now they're in a complex setting. And lastly, I invite you to, um, and your book also invites you to do this, but this is we're going to see this result a ton of times, so it's worth doing. So um, integrate 1 over z minus w, okay, over gamma, where gamma is any circle centered at w, okay, oriented counterclockwise. So let me give you the picture here. So let's say this is the complex plane. Let's say this is w. So gamma is just going to be this circle here. Let's pretend like that's a good circle. And it's oriented counterclockwise like this. Okay, so we're going this way. Okay, so what this, this um, result is saying is that if you integrate the function one over z minus w over this path, you always get two pi i, which is kind of crazy if you think about it, because what this essentially is saying, it doesn't matter what the radius of the circle is, you're always gonna get the same value out. Okay, a really, really gnarly and awesome um, result here. But I recommend you do this because we are going to see this, this result show up in a lot of calculations that we do later on. And a little hint, okay? So remember, parameterizations don't matter, right? So if we know that gamma is a circle of W of radius R, we can automatically say gamma, or we can let gamma, I should say, 
be W, our center, plus R, e to the i t, where R is our radius, okay, the radius of the circle. And then i t, that's giving us our curve, or e to the i t, I should say, is giving us our curve there. Okay, So let gamma be this, and then choose the correct time values. Okay, You only want to get one rotation. And then if you go about this kind of similar to what we did earlier, you should be able to show that this integral is actually 2 pi i. So I recommend you all doing that because we will see this again.